good afternoon, everyone. Um, of course, before I start the actual presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of the Archaeology in Action Lectures in the Great Rindus Valley, Ute Franke and Vienne Prabhakar, for inviting me to discuss specific aspects of my research, the origin and use of the writing and administrative technologies in the Indus civilization. I would also like to thank some colleagues whose research has contributed tremendously to this presentation. Among others, I would like to mention Asko Parpola, Mark Neuer, Massimo Vidale, and Andreas Pools, who kindly granted me access to his online corpus of Indus texts. Okay, sorry. See, this is the eight lectures on the Indus civilization. There is not much I can say to introduce this historical phenomenon. However, if anyone is here for a more general interest in writing and administration, the Indus or Arabian civilization had developed along the Indus River Basin and in the neighboring regions of present-day Pakistan and Northwestern India between about 2600 and 1900 BCE. Contrary to what some eminent scholars like Mortimer Wheeler have claimed in the past century, the development of such an advanced urban society in the Greater Indus Valley during the Bronze Age represented only the culmination of an indigenous cultural tradition rooted in the local Mesolithic and Neolithic periods. The Indus civilization ultimately resulted, in fact, from a long process of coherent selection synthesis, diffusion, and eventual crystallization of specific cultural traits from different regional cultures spread over a vast and highly differentiated territory. The invention, development, and the welcome sharing of a writing system was, of course, one of the most significant elements of cultural, social economic, and political cohesion among the different regions involved in the Indus phenomenon. In fact, as the Indus civilization began to disaggregate as an integrated political and economic system in the first centuries of the second millennium BC, the iconographic corpus identifying the ruling elites, including the writing system, was suddenly abandoned and fell into oblivion. The Indus civilization was coeval to other literate cultures in Western Asia, such as the Old Kingdom in Egypt and the Sumerian and Akkadian civilization in Mesopotamia. However, as we will see now, in the Indus civilization, writing has always remained restricted to a specialized use, mainly linked to administration and trade. The seal on the right reports, in fact, the longest inscription ever found in Indus script, which counts 17 signs with no repetitions. The highly specialized use of writing in the industrialization was, of course, the result of a conscious decision to pursue an independent and original cultural trajectory. The Rappans, in fact, were well aware of other writing systems, as testified by the discovery of some Indus type scenes with inscription and cuneiform and linear Elamite scripts. Evidence for the use of Hindu script is recorded at hundreds of sites in the Greater Indus Valley, but also in other regions of Western and Central Asia, including the Iranian Plateau, the Oxus River Basin, Southeastern Arabia, the Gulf region, and Mesopotamia, testifying to the intense commercial and cultural interaction between these regions. To date, we have about 4,500 artifacts inscribed with signs of the Hindu script for a total of some 5,500 texts, either complete or with missing signs, and just under 20,000 signs occurrences. These numbers immediately tell us that even though we have a significant number of texts, the length of the description is quite short, with an average length between three and four signs. As I already said, the longest inscription is found on a small square seal from Monjodaro, and it counts 17 signs only. According to the most recent corpus compiled by Brian Wells in 2006 and kept up to date by Andreas Schultz, 
The industry currently counts just over 700 signs, 704 for the sake of precision. Most Indus signs are an abstract geometric shape, possibly recalling elements of the Indus architecture and material culture or abstract concept, while others clearly represent anthropomorphic figures, animals, or vegetal elements. Of course, as Egyptian hieroglyphs clearly demonstrated the fact that the signs of an ancient writing system had the shape of clearly recognizable objects and living beings is definitely not evidence of their pictographic or ideographic nature. Many Hindu signs are only minor variants of common graphic bases, but they also include combinational ligatures that might have indicated grammatical or syntactical proprieties. A group of Hindu signs featuring different combinations of long and short vertical segments, but probably numerical signs, which could, which could have been used to indicate quantities, dates, etc., combining decimal and octal systems. However, we cannot exclude the possibility that in specific contexts they could have assumed phonetic values. Although the total number of Hindu signs documented so far is around 700, the number of signs occurring at the individual sites is quite variable, ranging from about 500 at Mohenjo-daro and Arapa, which are the two largest and most ex extensively excavated Hindu sites, to the 150 to 100 in medium-sized settlement, as far as 60 to 20 in the smaller villages. The core of Hindu signs that occurred at least once at major Hindu sites of Manjodaro, Harappa, Dolavira, and Lothal counts only 92 signs, which, however, together cover more than 70% of the total occurrences. In terms of occurrence, most signs of the Hindu scripts are quite rare. One single sign, sign number 740 in West Corpus, alone accounts for about 11% of all occurrences. The three most frequent signs reach up to 20%, six signs reach up to 30%, and the 20 most frequent signs together cover half of the corpus. In most cases, these exceptionally frequent signs occupy a specific position at the beginning or the end of a sign stream. In particular, sign 740 occurs mainly at the left terminal position, marking the end of a writing stream. The relative position of signs at the beginning or end of a string is closely related, in fact, to the reading direction of a writing system. The reading direction of the script was originally inferred from the epigraphic study of the progression and overlapping of the signs in inscriptions scratched on ceramic containers. Using this method, the Hindu script was found to be consistently written from right to left. The right to left reading direction is now also confirmed by the statistical analysis of the segmentation of the inscriptions. The Hindu script does in fact show an evident asymmetry between the occurrence of signs at the left and the right end position of a string. Statistically, the signs were more evenly distributed at the right terminal position. In all, writing, in all known writing systems, this consistently indicates the beginning of a word. On the contrary, the occurrence of signs in the Hindu script is less balanced at the left terminal position, a situation that always marked the end of a word. Words in the Hindu script that started on the right and ended on the left. You can see here that the distribution of signs in the Hindu script is opposite to that of modern English, which we know is to be read from left to right. In English, in English the signs, in this case the letters, are more evenly distributed in the left terminal position than on the right hand. In fact, English words can start with many different letters, but fewer letters occur at the end of a word, like G, S, D, and Y. 
we know that this is due to the specific grammatical structures of the English language and is the written transcription. A significant piece of evidence originally inferred from the material culture and now confirmed also by applying the statistical method is that the inscription on stamp seal had to be read correctly from right to left in the impression and not directly from the seal. However, we should also consider that the brevity of the inscription and the usual symmetry of the English signs will have not made it so difficult for a well-trained scribe to read an inscription also in the wrong opposite direction, thus from left to right, directly from the seal. Exceptionally long inscription organized in more than one line show that the right to left reading direction may have followed a booster pattern progression. Then from right to left in the first line for, and from left to right on the second and so on. However, some of this inscription on more than one line may have simply contained two separate streams, as suggested by the presence of sign 740 at the end of the first line. Concerning the syntactic organization of the inscriptions, several scholars have independently isolated recurring patterns and divided the inscription into signs and groups of signs that consistently occupy specific positions and are likely to have had specific functions and meanings. As for the nature of the Hindu script, some scholars proposed that it was a purely logographic writing system composed of lexema morphemes with no connection to a spoken language. Statistical analysis recently performed by Andreas Schools, however, suggests that the Indus script was a logosyllabic writing system consisting of half, half syllables and half logograms. At present, there is not much more I can say about the possible nature of the Indus script and its syntactical and grammatical structures. In fact, this topic complex is beyond the scope of this presentation, which focuses on the Indus script mainly from an archaeological perspective. In fact, I firmly believe that we cannot separate the statistical analysis from the archaeological and anthropological interpretation of the inscribed media, their discovery context, and their likely uses. So let's now see what objects were inscribed in the Hindu civilization. The most common inscribed objects were highly standardized stamp seals, which account for more than half of the inscribed media together. After the stamps, the second most common medium bearing, bearing in the script were pottery containers. Single signs or short sequences of signs were in fact traced onto ceramic containers before or after they filed. In exceptional cases, inscriptions were also painted on vessels. Such inscription may have indicated ownership, but also information about the content, the capacity, and the storage of the vessels, or may also have an, an apotropaic meaning. It should be noted that this handwriting did not lead to the eventual development of a typographical version of the Hindu script. In addition to the seals and the ceramic containers, many other objects bear inscription in the Hindu script. Inscribed wooden molds were used to stamp or small ceramic containers before their firing, as well as tiny faience tablets or tokens and various types of terracotta tablets. Inscribed tablets were exceptionally made also by casting copper into a mold. Inscriptions were also engraved on steatite tablets and highly standardized copper tablets, on ivory rods, and on stoneware bands. Other objects, such as metal tools and weapons, may also have been occasionally inscribed. Thus, in the Indus civilization, inscribed media were always small objects with tiny short inscriptions that were visible only as the result of voluntary personal interactions. The sole exception to this miniaturistic world of private inscriptions 
is the three meter long signboard found just outside the monumental entrance to the citadel of Dolabia. The fact that the most common inscribed objects in the Indo civilization were seeds and pottery containers is no coincidence. Rather, this is evident, this evidence finds its explanation in the context of invention and early development of the industry. The process toward the invention of the industry began around the mid fourth millennium BC. In these periods, Communities settled in the different regions of the Greater Indus Valley developed converging paths toward increasing cultural complexity based on the conceptually comparable but still distinct material foundation. Supra regional interactions for the procurement of raw materials and the exchange of commodities eventually led to the selection, synthesis, and the vital assimilation of specific cultural traits from regional areas throughout the greater industry. Two of such cultural traits that eventually became shared throughout the Indus Valley were the so-called potter's marks and the stamp seals. In the second half of the fourth millennium, stamp seals and signs traced on pottery containers before their firing were introduced almost simultaneously in different regions of the greater Indus Valley. Unfortunately, Information of this phenomenon is scarce and discontinuous because these phases are often buried under the thick anthropic deposits of the major Rappan sites. However, where the, these data are available, as in the case of Nargar in central Baluchistan, they appear to have been linked to the mass production and super regional distribution of such ceramic containers. At Mergar, the potter's marks were always single signs traced on pots or goblets that were not used as storage containers, as well as on canisters used to protect and control the firing of small vessels. This evidence excludes the possibility that these particular marks indicated, for example, the capacity of the vessels. Rather, based on the evidence from a large accumulation of vessels discarded after a failure in the firing process, the excavators proposed that they were used to temporarily identify ownership during collective firings in communal kilns. Potters probably marked some of their vessels accordingly to the type or sex while the others were assigned according. In this phase, the meaning of such marks that was the univocal identification of ownership was temporary and remained valid only for the duration of a particular firing event. This interpretation seems to be supported by the evident reduction in the number and eventual disappearance of the potter marks between the later phase of Margar and the earliest phase of Naushara, when a new type of small kill for pottery, similar to the one shown in the slide, was introduced. As a result, collective firings were no longer used and the potter's marks no longer necessary. In the second half of the fourth millennium BC, pre-firing potter's marks with the same general features described for those uh, found at Mergar became almost ubiquitous in the greater Indus Valley. However, while at most sites, the use of these marks remain restricted to pottery containers, at sites, sites such as Ragmandari and Rafa, they have been engraved on seals as well. These button stamp seals in ivory from Ragmandari as different animals and geometric motifs engraved on the two sides. All such signs, both the animals and the geometric designs, also appear in the corpus of pre-firing potter's marks discovering the pre indus levels of the site. So, at the end of the fourth millennium, there was a group of signs shared between pottery and seals, probably indicating personal identification. The same process can also be observed at Arab. As at Margar and Ragmanderi, Stamp seals and potter marks were introduced at the Rapa in the second half of the third millennium. However, while the cultural phenomenon is comparable, the signs in use at the Rapa show more strict similarities to the later Indus script. Moreover, at the Rapa, 
In the first centuries of the third millennium, the number and complexity of sign traced and scratched on pottery containers further increased. They also began to be used in combination of two or more signs. Most of the seals on the Tarapa were still stamps with geometric motifs very similar to those on the Rakhmanderi and other sites in the Great Indus Valley. However, the exceptional discovery of a clay ceiling found discarded in a fireplace, radiocarbon dated to 2800 BC, testifies not only to the introduction of seal based administrative procedures in the Great Indus Valley, but also to the use at the Rapa as well of the same corpus of signs on both pottery and seals. Remarkably, while the use of signs on pottery and seals at Rakhmanderi was specific to that site or area, there is no doubt that the signs used at Arapa were a prototype of the industry. In summary, between the end of the fourth and the first centuries of the third millennium BC, we can trace the transition and the eventual sharing of the same coherently large in corpus of signs from potter's marks traced on crude pottery vessels before their firing to post-firing graffiti scratched on the surface of ceramic vessels to monumental signs carefully engraved on stamp seals on stamps used to see movable containers and rooms. In this process, we also see the transition from the use of single signs to their combination into short strings of several signs. In my opinion, the passage of the same corpus of signs from the potter marks, so to univocally indicate ownership only temporarily to stamp seals on which signs were used to permanently and by univocally indicate personal identification, can be regarded as the actual conceptual, conceptual foundation of the industry. You can firmly date this event between the end of the fourth and the beginning of the third millennium definitely before 2800 BC. Although introduced around 2800 BC, as proven by the discovery of a single unfortunately broken seal specimen at Arapa, the typical Hindu seeds with an inscription in Hindu script above a standing male animal were already in use throughout the entire Greater Indus Valley by at least 2600 BC. Thanks to the stylistic periodization by Mark and Oyer and the new excavations in the Gagarapra Basin, we can now divide the seal type into periods according to specific, consistent stylistic and morphological features. On this basis, we should now be able to start reconstructing the evolution of the Indus script through the different periods and regions without considering it as a monolithic system that remained essentially unchanged throughout the entire Indus Valley for more than 500 years. Let's now take a closer look at the characteristics of the Indus stamp seals and see how and for what purpose they were used and who actually used them. Stamp seals made of high fire CFI are one of the most distinctive standardized production of the Indus civilization. Standard Indus seals are squarish in shape and have an hemispherical perforated knob on the back used to string an older seal. They were consistently engraved following a specific compositional syntax with the profile image of a single standing male animal, sometimes represented in front of an enigmatic object, and nearly always below a short sequence of Hindu sign carved specularly as to be read correctly only after being stamped on clay or other soft materials. These icons were selected among a specific set of about a dozen animals, real or imaginary, including in order of increasing frequency, the tiger, water river buffalo, the Indian rhinoceros, different species of wild goat, the Asian elephant, and the zebu. Of particular importance is the Indian bison or short horned bull with the head lower as if it was charging or grazing. In fact, this animal characterizes the absolute majority of the Indus type and Indus related seals found outside the Greater Indus Valley, 
suggesting that it was the symbol of Parappan merchants engaged in external trade. We will return on this concept at the very end of the presentation. In addition to real animals, the Hindu seals also include imaginary composite creatures, such as the three-headed bovin, bovids, and what Massimo Vedale and I call the Rapan Chimera. Exceptional Hindu seals were also engraved in simple and rather standardized narrative scenes, probably related to religious and mythological beliefs. The most common and iconic creator represented in the Hindu stamp seals is the so called Harappan unicorn. Harappan unicorns are depicted as humpless, bull like animals with a single sinus horn protruding unnaturally from the nape. They are always represented standing in a file with only one ear raised, a prominent eye, and a raised ma rounded muscle. Like all other animals in the Hindu seals, also unicorns are always clearly gendered as males. In the beginning, most scholars consider the Hindu the Rapan unicorns to be just a distorted representation of a real two horned bull represented in profile with the two horns perfectly superimposed, as bulls were rendered in the Near East. However, in the Hindu imagery, other bovids or goats are always represented realistically with the two horns. Moreover, evident differences in the rendering and shape of the horns also exclude the possibility that the few seals with the unicorn as a component of multi-headed creators could have represented the same two horned animal in different poses. In summary, we can confidently disregard the hypothesis of a two real horned bull represented in profile. On the other hand, the hypothesis suggests that the Indus unicorn were fantastic creators with a single horn is indeed confirmed by the discovery at several Indus civilization sites of small terracotta figurines of bull-like animals with a single horn very similar to those carved on the seals. These figurines clearly represented an animal, an animal other than the Indian rhinoceros, the figurines of which are completely different from those of the so-called unit. This evidence indisputably demonstrates that during the second half of the third millennium, this fantastic beast was conceived by the Indus people as an actual unicorn. That said, in this context, it's critical to notice that in terms of frequency, the unicorn characterizes the absolute majority of seals at all Indus sites with a mean frequency of nearly 80%. Despite the large number of seals discovered in the civilization sites, their function has long been debated. The number of clay seals, in fact, is much lower than expected if you compare the Hindu civilization with coeval contexts in Western Asia, where clay seals are found by the thousand. Instead, we only have a couple of hundred clay seals in the entire greater Hindu society. This disproportion has led scholars to speculate. According to the late Moritz Tosi, for example, seals in the Indus Valley did not serve the same function as elsewhere. On the other hand, Greg Possel has proposed that in the Indus civilization, seals may have been used primarily as, visual, as a visual identification. We'll see soon that they were both right and wrong at the same time. The detailed study of the seal lo sealed lockers and containers, the frequent discovery of the seals used to stamp them, and most of all, the geochemical analysis of the clays used for sealing have revealed that in Western Asia, seal-based administration was not used to ensure the integ integrity of shipped packages, but to manage and record access to commodities stored in warehouses under the responsibility of specific bureaucrats working within a centralized hierarchical institution, which may have been based either on kinship bonds or a political organization. This fundamental concept has been often neglected or misunderstood 
In most of the old research on the stem seeds and clay seeds is found at in the civilization site. Pending analytical confirmation, yet, there is, however, a direct and robust indication of a comparable use of the seals also in the Indo civilization. As Capar Paola, in fact, noticed that two of the seals found at Kautal were used to stand some of the clay ceilings found at the same site. I hope that in the near future, we will be allowed to perform analytical studies of the clays used for sealing also at the Indus site. This evidence, however, in my opinion, already testifies to the use of seas and their impression on clay tags, mainly for the local management of rooms and commodities, and not for securing shipment of packages also in the Indus civilization. The evidence for the small number of clay ceilings from the Indus civilization site should be evaluated, first of all, based on the specific features of the Indus urban centers and how they have been excavated. This is not, it is not worthy, in fact, that the largest clusters of clay ceilings found at Bronze Age sites in Western Asia were discovered inside buildings destroyed by major fire events, such as the Minon palaces of the stock of Knossos on Crete and the Lake Turuk palace of Aslan Tepe in Eastern Anatolia. In this light, the fact that the earliest clay ceiling discovered in the Indus Valley was found discarded in a fireplace and that the largest cluster of some 70 clay ceilings found at Rotal came from bird building is therefore most likely not coincidental. Bird buildings are indeed extremely, extremely rare at industrialization sites, and Indus clay ceilings, unless intentionally or accidentally fired, were apparently extremely fragile and difficult to identify during excavation. So we are left now with two major options. Is the possible, possible influence of exceptional depositional and post-depositional events sufficient to justify the discovery of only a few hundred clay ceilings at Indus sites, as opposed to cluster of several thousand at Bronze Age sites in Western Asia? Or should we consider the existence of fundamental differences between the bureaucratic and administrative system used in the two regions? After nearly two decades devoted to studying in seals and their impressions on clay, I'm quite confident in saying that the stamp seals were primarily used also in the Indus civilization for the local administration, control and management of storerooms, movable containers, and the stored commodities. However, rather than managing the daily redistribution of large quantities of food rations, as in Western Asia, Seals in the Indus Valley may have been used instead, and here I am speculating, to control the circulation of commodities and raw materials of strategic socioeconomic and ideological importance in the Indus society. After seeing what they were used for, let's now see how seals were used in the Indus civilization, and at the end of this presentation, also who used them. The comprehensive study of the clay ceilings on the Indus civilization site has proven that a stem seal could have been used to secure different types of lockers and containers alone or in combination with other seals on the same clay tag. About one third of the clay ceilings on the Indus sites retain, in fact, multiple impressions of up to five different seals. So far, not clear patterns have emerged in the use of seals within the Indus administrative system. The same seal could have been used to stand both uh, clay tags with single and multiple impressions in variable association with other seals and to secure different types of containers. It is interesting to note, however, that almost all the clay ceilings stamped using standard Indus seals a description well readable, while the animal icon was readily recognizable in its entirety, being covered by other impressions, obliterated by fingerprints, or simply not impressed at all. In the administrative system of the Indus civilization, 
The inscription on the stamp seals appears to have played the central role, while the iconography was not equally important or most likely to perform primarily a function of visual identification of the user of the seal user directly from the seal. Let's now see who was identified by the animals of the seals and what their function were. We have already noted that despite significant variability in size, stylistic treatment, and carving quality between the different regions of the Great Caritas Valley, and even within the same site, which may have reflect workshop and regional variation, the Hindu seal is strictly respected, a dogmatic set of basic rules in terms of raw material, morphology, formal composition, and iconography. To understand we used them, I deconstructed the founding features and compared the resulting patterns with those of Near Eastern cylinder seals, which are known in greater detail. Sorry. In Western Asia, cylinder seals were primarily used to indicate personal identification and ownership. What is interesting to observe in this context, however, is that first, there were no restrictions regarding the ownership of the seal. Anyone who could afford one could own one or even more. Cylinder seals were used by men and women of a wide, wide range of social statuses and occupations, including rulers and priests, soldiers and scribes, craftspeople and merchants, and even servants and slaves. Even gods had their own seals. Second, their production in terms of design and material was not legally regulated, except for the use of specific materials and iconography that in some periods and region were exclusive to the royal family. Thus, cylinder seals reflect the personal tastes and preferences of their owners. We have already seen, as we have already seen, Hindu seals were instead made almost exclusively from specific variety, varieties of steatai, which were each treated after the motifs and the description were carved causing them to harden and turn whitish. The use of other materials, such as terracotta, ivory, copper, or silver, is almost negligible. Moreover, nearly 80% of them were carved with the image of a standing unicorn, while the remaining with the image were carved with the image of one of the few other animals, uh, part of the standard series, or, or exceptionally, with a simple narrative scene. In the Near East, on the other hand, cylinder seals were produced using different contrasting raw materials and various subjects to maximize personalization. Of course, specific trends in fashion, as well as phenomena of emulation, developed spontaneously in the different periods and regions, but the seal owners were allowed to decide arbitrarily, without any legal restriction, the features of their own seal or seals. In summary, although based on comparable forms of personal identification and generally used to perform conceptually similar administrative procedures, the production of seals in the Near East and the Indus Valley during the second half of the third millennium was probably regulated by practices and prescriptions that led to opposite material outcomes. In the Near East, cylinder seals were produced to maximize personalization using a variety of different raw materials and subjects. If we describe this production model using the modern theories of commodity branding and marketing strategy, the production of cylinder seeds is, per is perfectly described by a situation of competition, a system that involves a large and ever increasing number of components that are functionally compared but as much differentiated as possible in terms of style and quality. A modern example of competition in brand development is modern business cards, the production of which is also based on extreme personalization to the unique combination of colors and materials, logos and iconographies with possible textual indication or bionivical personal identification. 
Of course, I'm not talking here about the functioning of these objects. Sales and business cards are different, although not so distant uses. I'm defining how they were materially conceptualized, what were the rules behind their conception and use. If we apply the same theoretical model to the induced seals, with a limited number of standardized iconographies and the almost exclusive use of uh, steatitis as the raw material, instead of a situation of competition like the cylinder seals, they describe an unbalanced form of oligopoly. An unbalanced oligopoly occurs when, in a system based on a limited number of components, which is an oligopoly, one of these components has the absolute majority or more of the recurrences. In our case, the majoritarian, the majority component is, of course, the unicorn. To give another example linked to modern practices, which I think describe the Indus with a high degree of accuracy, in our contemporary society, they will function like corporate ID badges. Here, we must note that while a situation of competition has no theoretical limits to, to development, an unbalanced oligopoly is inherently ugly and stable. And unless there are rules and procedures that protect or justify the presence of the minority components, it tends to suddenly collapse into a cartel balance, balancing the components or more commonly into a monopoly with only the majority compo components surviving to control the whole system. This is exactly what would have happened if the animal motifs on the Indus seals would have represented competing clans or trading communities, as most scholars have proposed in the past, with the unicorn representing the most numerous, widespread, and economically influential clan. However, this was definitely not the case in the Indus civilization if we consider that the seal production in the greater Indus Valley continued without significant changes in the syntactical organization of the seals, in the raw material fuels, and in the limited iconographic repertoire for almost one millennium, from the introduction of the seal type in the early Indus phase around 2800 BC. In my opinion, this evidence can only be explained if the production and use of seals in the Indus civilization was regulated by a set of dogmatic prescription that had to be strictly observed in order to produce a seal that was legally authorized to identify specific bureaucratic roles cooperating within a highly structured administrative, possibly economic and or political system. In summary, while the Neristan cylinder seals with all their variants and attempts at diversification were owned by a single individual, and even when used to testify to public procedures, they represented first a private individual and only then his or her socioeconomic or political role. The standard industry seems to have instead represented the bureaucratic role of the official users rather than the private identity. To conclude, Let's attempt to define some of the roles embodied by the industries. In the past, scholars have proposed that the animals in the industries were totemic symbols and that the seals were used by competing clans or trading co communities with the unicorn representing the most numerous and widespread clan. We have just seen, if my reconstruction is correct, of course, that this is not possible. And that, Indus, and that seals in the Indus civilization represent specific socioeconomic roles with the, within a highly structured administrative and possibly economic system. The comparison that you see here with the guilds of arts and trades of 13th century Florence is just one of the many possibilities on the table. Nevertheless, I think that this particular parallel should be explored in more detail in the future. A more contextualized answer comes from a seminal study by Elizabeth Durin Caspers, later formalized by Massimo Vidale. They noticed, in fact, 
that the, that the Indian bison, or short horned bull with the head lower, is, more, is almost the only animal represented in the numerous Indus related seals discovered outside the Greater Indus Valley. Vidal therefore proposed that the Indian bison, the Indian bison was the symbol of the Indus trading entities operating in the West. On this basis, Massimo Vidal and I later propose that as a consequence and by extension, the unicorn, by far the most common animal on the Indus seals in the greater Indus Valley, may have been the brand of the most numerous bureaucrats in a developed early urban context. Most likely, small scale accountants who mastered recording, keeping, taxation, and to some extent, possibly also the writing. This last slide sort of summarizes the topics that, that I discussed today, writing and administration. Although there is certainly much more to say on both subjects and their links, I have tried to present some original aspects rather than a mere summary of the different information and theories. Of course, much more work needs to be done to refine these ideas and test them. For example, there are some clay ceilings at different sites that were made with seals that did not belong to the so-called standard series, like geometric seals or even seals belonging to, the, to foreign cartoons like the Arbanas. Unfortunately, I don't think we could have the definitive answers about the actual use of seals in the Indus civilization until a comprehensive analytical study of the clay used for sealing is allowed and carried out. Moreover, I really do hope that a long-term collaborative project on the industry will be established sooner, sooner or later. Nowadays, mathematicians cannot work without archaeologists and the other way around. Most of all, I do hope to see a revival of intense field work at Hindu sites, both in India and Pakistan, very soon. Not only we do need fresh data based on accurate stratigraphic excavation and carbon documentation of the archaeological context, we also need to prove the academic and scientific community worldwide that the research on the industrialization is alive and open to collaboration. So my presentation is over, and I hope I have been able to provide you with some food for thought. In any case, thank you very much for your time and attention.